வணக்கம் நமஸ்காரம் குட் ஈவினிங் மெனி தேங்க்ஸ் ஃபார் எக்ஸ்டெண்டிங் திஸ் இன்விடேஷன் எல்டிஃப் தேங்க் யூ எவர் ஸோ மச் தேங்க் யூ இம்மென்ஸ்லி அண்ட் மை டாபிக் ஆஸ் ஐ ஆல்ரெடி கிவன் யூ த ஆர்ட் அண்ட் சயின்ஸ் ஆஃப் ட்ரான்ஸ்லேஷன் அண்ட் நோ வண்டர் ஐ ஸ்டார்டட் இன் த்ரீ லாங்குவேஜஸ் ஐ ஸ்டார்டட் வித் அ வணக்கம் பிகாஸ் ஐ பிலாங் டு தமிழ்நாடு அண்ட் வணக்கம் இஸ் அ கிரீட்டிங் விச் does not have or does not attribute itself to any particular season of a day and namaskaram also uh, it it gives you a kind of a warmth and it greets you not only for a day for a week or a month a namaskaram will hold good and valid whenever it is said to whomsoever it is uttered to uh, coming back to your good morning or good good afternoon or good evening unfortunately it's highly seasonal now i have taken up this topic uh, because uh, i am into translation and fortunately for me my first doctoral degree was on translating kuruntogai and uh, the person who introduced me thank you ever so much um kuruntogai happens to be a vintage classic of tamil which is easily 3000 years old and um, uh, it has to be translated into it has been translated into english by many people and my assignment my project for the first phd was on translating kurundagai very much like matthew arnold's on translating homer and fortunately for me my guide was uh, dr marudanayagam a double doctorate and a dlit also most of you would have known him right and had it not been for him i would not have pursued with my second doctoral degree in tamil because my mother tongue is tamil and the first language is of course Uh, tamil and when i started questioning the commentaries uh, in tamil on this vintage classic which unfortunately most of the translators try translating the commentaries rather than uh, the original uh, people started asking me the question uh, do you think you are proficient and efficient enough to ask questions on the commentaries so my guide dr marudanayagam all he said is Uh, you can silence people very easily if only you pursue with another doctoral degree in tamil and uh, i enjoyed and the third part of it is my husband he has taken his doctoral degree in mt vasudevan nayar the western impact on mt vasudevan nayar's writing so translation is our uh, it it has almost become our middle name and uh, i thought i would rather give a kind of an introduction it's going to be the tip of the tip of an iceberg it's not even the tip of an iceberg it's a tip of the tip uh, because uh, within well within 60 minutes i do not know how i am going to contain but whatever it is uh, i do not know about my audience either so hopefully i think uh, i do not know what i gathered from the earlier communication it's mentioned students e n g g i understand it should be engineering or is it a short form for english i do not know but nonetheless uh, i'll try to make it as uh, appealing as possible but before i commence the talk as such before i get into the topic i just would like to remind you of something very beautiful uh, about pablo picasso the father of modern art it is in uh, april 27th of april 1937 a little town called garnica was carpet bombed by the nazi fight of flights and uh, the targets were random and most of the civilians lost their life later on when you read history you understand that this bombing took place not because they wanted to uh, completely destroy certain specific targets it was just to create a kind of fear in the mind of people fear in the mind of innocent people about war and it was exactly during that time pablo picasso uh, the uh, master artist now he was in paris and when he read the news he was so very disturbed that he uh, brought out his masterpiece more than life size masterpiece garnica which is a very very disturbing painting oil on canvas it was a very disturbing painting uh, which depicts uh, the anti war feelings of the artist and we understand there is a little story i do not know whether it really took place but i i love to believe it fine i i understand that pablo picasso was busy with this beautiful painting which depicts the war time atrocities and during that time a few soldiers just walked into the studio 
and they looked at it and it was it was a very very disturbing sight and they turned around and asked Picasso did you do it Picasso just turned around and looked into the eyes and uh, he just replied no you did it fine so what do I understand this is translation this is exactly translation if you are going to understand translation as uh, taking a text from one language to another language I'm sorry translation is older than language because man wanted to communicate anything living always is driven by this motive to communicate so we communicate through our body language, we communicate through our gestures, we, we have been communicating even before we invented language. Fine. And we are, we are lucky, we are very rich, we are very fortunate in a way that animals and birds and bees, every, all these have only a language and we have languages. And more than that, we can always record our experiences, our thoughts. Our wisdom can be put in the form of a capsule and handed down to the next generation and you call that rich reservoir literature. Now this particular story tells you, you know, Picasso went on to describe the meaning of a beautiful painting comes out only through the eyes of the person who looks at it. So as long as the person does not express what he feels on seeing a particular painting, none of us would ever understand or try fathoming uh, how, what, what could have been the deep emotion that operates behind uh, this particular uh, experience. Now coming back to my topic. Translation in a classroom or when you teach the other tongue. I, I call English the other tongue because Tamil is my mother tongue. Even then, there is yet another story. It talks about why we need the other tongue and why there has to be translation. It talks about how on a one hot afternoon, a mother cat and its little one, the kitten, they went out for a walk. For no reason, I know. They went out for a walk and from nowhere came a dog and the dog started chasing uh, the mama cat and the little one. These two ran and ran and ran. And you know pretty well, a dog wouldn't just chase, it, it will continue to bark and it barked and it started chasing and these two ran and ran and ran at one point of time, uh, the mama cat could not just continue the running. She stood her ground, she turned around, the little kitten was so confused, it was really scared. The mama cat turned around, looked into the eyes of the dog and said, bow bow. It was now the dog that got confused because it expected a cat to say meow. But the dog, cat said, bow bow. Now the dog ran away. The little kitten looked at his mother and the mother looked at the little one and said, now you understand the use of a second language, right? So if a cat can understand the language of a dog and save itself, the other tongue becomes imperative. But how do we make use of translation in the classes when you have the mother tongue and the other tongue? But before I go on to the other tongue, that is English, unfortunately, English have been, they have been calling all the regional languages in India vernacular. Even I did the same thing, unfortunately. Vernacular medium of education, English medium of education, vernacular journals. Now what happened when I took my first doctoral degree, the first thing I got corrected, uh, my, my guide corrected this particular usage. He said you would not use it anymore. Vernacular, if you go in for the etymology of the word, you will understand that it means vernacular is vernacular language is the language of the slave. We aren't slaves to anybody. English was vernacular to Greek and Latin. So we would rather call it the regional language. And as you were introducing the role of LTIF, fine, it is to empower people, it is to enlighten people. If that is the motive of LTIF, I would rather say, fine, I am, I am, I, when I introduce myself, I say, I am, I am not an English professor, I am a professor of English, I am an Indian professor. So I am, I am better than an Englishman because we have got other languages in India. Fine, the English men just gave us another perspective towards life. That's all. Even before the arrival, we can, we have, uh, we have had enough and more of literature, ancient literature, vintage classics. But English as it happens to be a window language, it's better the children 
be it village or semi rural or urban whomsoever it may be let them get the hang of the language so that they know how to operate how to function with this language and they will not be tongue tied when they find themselves in places where this is the only language that is spoken now translation came into being maybe when you go to bible you will talk about the tower of babel fine is the curse of babel thanks a lot had it not been for the curse of babel we would not a translator would not have found its place anyway there would have been just one language and there would not have been any need for translation but coming back translation is used in the classes but when you talk about the evolution of translation it has been an art it has been a science time immemorial two things decided why translation has to be used one is for political reasons people needed translation and for religious reasons people needed translation so for non secular reasons and for political reasons people did uh, get the help of translation if a king wanted his subjects to know what he has in his mind or his methods of governance he his the subjects the conquered subjects people who do not know his tongue they may have to understand what he wants to tell them and translation was brought to be and secular texts when the religious texts have to be given to the people fine again translation came into being but the secular text and the non secular text the religious texts always had a problem because a translator tends to become an interpreter he he or she becomes an advocate he or she becomes an adjudicator a commentator and most of the religious texts do not give this permission to a translator so you have to stay away from playing any of these roles without your knowledge but why do i call it a science why do i call it an art i call it a science because science has theories science makes use of tools to prove and disprove the theories science repeatedly puts these theories to test and new theories come out and when you talk about the tools which are being used in translation you have machine translation most of you would have started using it whether it is uno or parliament or assembly whichever may be the place where more than one language is spoken and people who do not know the other tongue they get the help of machine translation fine but when you talk about the tools inside a class i again take my audience to be the students fine when you talk about translation uh, as a science then you understand uh, an atlas is a tool historical evidences happen to be tools geographical uh, situations happen to be tools proverbs are tools every piece of literature that is available is a tool and a language laboratory can also be a tool because the way you pronounce a particular name or a pronounce a particular word it talks about the origin of the word in french you articulate it in a different way pronounce it in a different way and if the same word has to be pronounced in german fine you pronounce it in a different way the very pronunciation tells you the name and the person from which country he or she would have come fine and more than that a thesaurus a dictionary all these happen to be tools when you talk about translation as an art it's something spontaneous it's something creative it's intuitive it's natural it's free so when you go back to the definition of translations on one side you have uh, all the theorists most of them happen to be bible translators because uh, no individual was given the power of translating holy bible it was always a team and whatever the team translated that has to be again scrutinized and there should not be interpretations which um, are invented by the translator so what happens you find the translating group has to work on it piece by piece but all these people did bring about some kind of uh, definition for translation so the original was called source language text and the language into which the text got translated that was called the target language so when you talk uh, catford when he defined translation he said it is the transference of the textual material from source language into the target language catherine bun 
you she she again talked about something totally different Catherine Bangle she said it is not just uprooting the textual material from one place and again allowing it replanting it in another place it is retelling as naturally as possible as naturally as possible as you find it in the original so it is not just replacement of textual material like catford put you find Catherine Bangle saying it is retelling when we go to Eugene Nida, again, a theorist. Now, he goes on to say it is just not the textual material that has to be taken from one place to another place, from one language to another language. He rather calls the target language receptor language. A more refined term is now used. It's not target language. It's not target audience. It's receptor language where he talks about the equivalent trying to find out an equivalent for the word which is used in the original fine on the other hand when you come to creative writers who have always been against translation we start with i understand some of you uh, would have gone through um, british history that is the literary history of english where you come upon the augustan age to start with because they had a very very clear idea so when you talk about the king you call it the augustan age fine or you you call it the age of prose you call it the age of periodicals right you call it the age of neoclassical time fine when you come to dryden now he was very very clear he said unfortunately there is no perfect translation there is no complete translation there are only good satisfactory attempts made you know, when a theorist looks at a text, he looks at it from an entirely different point of view. He has all the tools available. He has uh, the geography, the history, everything about a place and everything about a particular text which has come out of that place. And he makes use of all the tools, looked at it from a, he looks at it from a scientific perspective. On the other hand, you come to a creative writer uh, like Dryden. He says it's unfortunate that it is being treated this way. Literature cannot be translated completely. It, only good attempts can be made. And a good translator is one who continues to translate again and again until he feels he has captured the very spirit of the original work. Now, I'm reminded of a Zen a painter you know, he, who taught all his disciples beautiful ways of painting uh, every little scenery of nature but when he had to paint he kept on painting just a blade of grass and one of his students asked him day in and day out this is the only painting you make and wh why what could be the reason and his answer was I am yet to perfect it I am yet to bring out the proper imitation of a real blade of grass which I happen to see there in nature so this is a predicament of a translator he is, if he is more of an artist, like a poet, like a creative writer, he can never be satisfied with his rendering. I put it this way, his, I don't call it translation, with his rendering or his version. Because it keeps on challenging when you, especially when you try translating poetry. What is left behind is poesy. You may take one word from the source language, transport it to the receptor language. But while this transportation successfully gets completed, what is left behind or what gets etherized and what vanishes there in thin air happens to be the poetic spirit, poesy. So Dryden said, I can comfortably divide or uh, classify translation under three headings. First one, he said, is metaphrase. And uh, he also very sarcastically, he puts it, turning the author word for word or word by word it almost becomes a kind of a literal translation or it almost becomes a kind of dissecting uh, the create creation and the writer and uh, we personally feel when a poet is subjected to this kind of a torture he he would rather be turning in his grave because uh, you you try to pick up every little word get its equivalent from a thesaurus and transport it to the receptor language so the first one is metaphrase the second one, the middle path, happens to be paraphrase. Now, I, I quote Dryden. Paraphrase. 
paraphrase is more a Ciceronian way of translation which means sense based translation. It is not just uprooting every word and try to extract its meaning. You go in for a phrase, you go in for the context, you add other things which contribute to the meaning, which add to the layers of meaning uh, that get submerged in this little word. So it is sense based translation which he calls the golden median, the golden middle path. A way you can be closer to the original, be loyal to the original and you can also be communicative to the receptor language. For example, if I have to transfer Homer, I do not know how the audience who listen to Homer, they would not have read Homer I guess, who listen to Homer would have understood, appreciated and received him. All I do in 2021 is to guess about the reaction of that particular listening audience, not even reading audience, I call them listening audience. If that is true, to whom should I be a contemporary? Am I to be a contemporary uh, to the audience of Homer who are no longer available anyway, whom I do not know how they were, how they reacted to it? Or am I to be a contemporary to the people to whom I take Homer? So it, uh, my translation of Homer should not become a text kept in the library, dusted again and again. My text should be alive. If I have to make it alive, it has to reach the hands of ordinary people who will not understand the language in which Homer communicated to his listeners. So we come to the second one that is paraphrase. Paraphrase, you are trying to be as loyal to the original as possible and you are also very close to your reading audience for whom you get the work translated because you are very passionate about a particular work and you would like to communicate your passion and you would like to communicate its worth and you would like to hand it down to the next generation helping them to appreciate a masterpiece of the vintage right and the third part happen classification happens to be imitation the problem with the imitation is the translator has got all allowance to totally um, Completely he can reject the original and give his version or give his idea of what he understood or what he thought the original would have said. And that's exactly why you have all the commentaries. We really wonder whether the commentary uh, mentions or it creates something which was not available, the original. And along with Dryden, we have Alexander Pope who also advocated the middle path. He went on to say the rendering should be, should have a resemblance to the original. It has to have some similarity and it need not be the same. You know, for the first time we understand uh, translation from the perspective of an artist, not from the perspective of a theorist who is very scientific in his approach, who is clinical in his approach, if I can use that word. Here it's not clinical, it's highly emotional. Now, in this context, I would like to draw your attention to another translation practice which is and which was available in India. We, we call it the Dhwani concept. So, they, in Dhwani, you, you just divide literature into Vastukavya and Rasakavya. Vastukavya becomes objective literature where you can turn the author word for word which is absolutely clinical, analytical, right? On the other hand, you have the rasa kavya. The rasa is an emotion and you cannot completely contain it in a single word as you do not have an equivalent for a word or the emotion it communicates or the feeling it addresses. You do not have an equivalent for the same word in the same language, leave alone borrowing from another language. So coming back again uh, to Alexander Pope, he also held the same view that translation is possible you even the best of the best translator can only try to bring in uh, as much as he can though the flavor of the soil in which this piece of literature was born cannot be completely uh, transported to another language. Now you have the cultural untranslatability right along with these people came another person and these two people, that is Alexander Pope and Dryden insisted that if you are going to translate a piece of poem, you have to necessarily be a poet or else it would rather be killing the very spirit of poetry. That's why they said when you translate poetry, poesy is lost. 
Next we have the Romantics and Romantics believed that translation is impossible. It's after all a kind of bridging of the gap whenever inspiration goes wanting. In Biographia Literaria, you find Coleridge going on uh, to tell us how a, a poem is an organic, it has an organic unity in it. It is inbuilt. The serpentine movement of words, that is how the first word spills its meaning to the second one and the second in turn to the third and the third in turn to the fourth. As a result of which there is a serpentine movement of meaning from one word to the other. So even if you remove one particular word, the whole construct would collapse. Now this is what the Romantics believed intensely without any doubt. So they, they treated translation with absolute contempt. When you come to Shelley, he, he is said, okay, you can translate, but it is not just a text. How will you translate the silence which is sandwiched between words? Now, I'd like uh, the audience to just contemplate over that particular statement. You, you think the complete meaning is capsuled in a word? Certainly not. So, if you ask me a question, and I start answering the question after a pause or I use a kind of uh, a filler, uh, a sp speech sound filler. You ask me about translation and uh, ma'am, how do you translate this particular one? And I do not immediately give an answer. I make use of human speech sound as a filler. I say, mm, yeah, I get your question. So what happens is, mm, is I have already started answering your question with this non-lexical filler, human speech sound filler, which cannot get translated. It just means that I have started thinking about your question and I am gathering my words to give you an appropriate answer. The, uh, the question which Shelley asked was, how will you translate the silence which gets sandwiched between words? How will you translate the text within the text, the pretext, the context, the subtext? Text doesn't mean just a word. Text doesn't mean just group of words arranged in a particular way to give a particular meaning. There is so much into it and imagination, it cannot be translated and he said no to translation. When you come to Victorian age, of course, we have Matthew Arnold. I should be extremely thankful to him because I borrowed, as he said, on translating Homer. And it's a beautiful article where he goes on to talk about the problems he came upon because Homer is so archaic. Homer's language is so uh, high, is so sublime. And if he is going to translate Homer as Homer should be translated, he says, I'm sorry, there will not be any reader at all. So I had problems while translating Homer. And Matthew Arnold, in this context, he goes on to say, I think I should be a contemporary to my people. I should go in with a language which is understood by my people. So I have translated Homer in such a way that had he been alive during my time, he would have written only this way in my tongue, trying to be as close as possible to the original right so we have on one hand the theorists who talk about the various ways of translating on the other hand you also have writer translators creators uh, Dryden did try his hand with translation Pope translated Matthew Arnold translated all these people who did try translation because they themselves were creators and they so much wanted to transport a beautiful masterpiece from their from another tongue to their tongue they had lots of problems here when we talk about bringing a text from one language to another language there are two things which are taken into consideration uh, by a translator one is domesticating a text the other one is alienating a text. Now, these two happen because of the cultural untranslatability. For example, just as an assignment, if only you give the members of ELTIF the translation assignment of the proverbs, which are as old as mountains, which you cannot just uproot a proverb from the place where it was born. And proverbs do not have an author they have collective authorship we do not know who created a particular uh, proverb 
but they are so appropriate they are so accurate they are just words of wisdom packed in again if i can use in such a brief manner so synoptic they are uh, you if you try to translate them into english take them from kerala transport them to another language which is totally different uh, then you will understand the climate which you have here in this particular the geographical condition the weather the climate the flora the fauna which are available only in god's own country cannot be uplift, uplifted and you cannot transfer it to another place where you do not find anything of these now we tried it i tried it in my classroom for the workshop it is just not translation theory it's also practice you understand that there are areas where you have to domesticate a text the text has to be made suitable for the reading audience of the receptor language or if you are going to transport a piece of work to an alien tongue you have to necessarily take into consideration alienating a text i can give you an example in the vintage classic of agam literature of tamil in which uh, uh, i think in the complete anthology you find uh, kurundagai also a part you have the word kallu kallu of course uh, I, i think any keralaite will know kallu kallu is not alcohol kallu is not alcohol so in vintage classic that is in agananur this particular word comes it talks about the the bite of a cobra and how the venom uh, how quick the venom is uh, to uh, to kill the person and this particular thing is being compared to uh, the intoxication anybody gets after having uh, a sip of kallu it just says paapu kadupanna thoppu kallu you have the word thoppu paapu refers to paambu paapu kadupu kadupu happens to be the pain that comes with the uh, bite of a cobra thoppu kallu the kallu has that kind of an intoxication but when it gets translated when you take it to a western reading audience who would not have had this kind of an experience right what happens is the translator has to be very very careful but unfortunately if the translator chooses another word not toddy but if he makes use of the word like alcohol the total cultural backdrop uh, the it it completely collapses so what i try to tell you is you have to be very very careful it's not just the tools which you have as the scientific support you have you should be both sensitive and sensible to the cultural untranslatability of certain things including the seemingly innocent looking ordinary proverb which you stumble upon day in and day out that is a kind of an assignment just collect proverbs unfortunately proverbs happen to uh, they they are uh, in the endangered uh, club of uh, literature nobody now uses any uh, proverb the proverb which has a collective authorship of the society as i told you is as old as a mountain give this assignment and then you will understand what we mean by equivalent and equivalence and that's exactly a way you you have uh, anton popovich who who comes he is uh, a theorist scientist who said that you have to make use of certain shifts when you translate uh, things which are rooted to a specific culture it can be a constituent shift because no two languages react in the same way they cannot be the one can be a left branching language the other one can be a right branching language tamil and english they happen to be mirror images and when you start translating a work from tamil take it to english or from english you bring it to tamil you have to be extremely careful because each language has got its own genius and you have to be very sensitive to the genius of an individual language if that is the case you will go in for a constituent shift you will make a shift not in the meaning but in the style in which you uh, present the source language text because it has to be suitable it has to be grammatically correct 
it has to be acceptable it, it should be in the ordinary person's everyday usage then you move on to genreic shift when you go for a genreic shift we all know uh, when i talk about genreic shift shakespeare's plays were there was a genreic shift charles lamb what did he do instead of uh, leaving them with the genre of drama he brought them to retold tales from shakespeare it was he had the target audience fixed in his mind he knew so the vocabulary has been selected because of that the tone is selected the texture of the language is selected all these a translator has to be very very careful you may ask me the question do you mean a retold story to be a translation yes of course an abridgment is a translation an adaptation is a translation retold stories are translations a paraphrase is a translation if i can again go quote uh, dryden so what happens that can be a genreic shift the sense that from one genre it can go to another one and that's why i started with gornica fine it was from the verbal medium to visual medium or whatever the soldier asked he said i didn't do it you did it so whatever was the emotion he felt in an abstract way he could just bring them forth on the canvas in the form of an oil painting and from one medium to another medium from something abstract to something concrete something visible something tangible something that could be understood something which appeals to the sensitivity of an individual when you talk about war so there is a genre shift you can you can tell your children how uh, harry potter jk rowling sitting with jk rowling and harry potter as a book in your hand gives you so much of scope to visualize your own harry your own hermione your own ron fine uh, your own dumbledore your own hogwarts fine because there is no limit at all there is no limit at all to your imagination but once you go sit from verbal medium to the visual medium it gets translated there is so much of scientific process that goes whatever could be read in a book cannot just be presented to the viewing audience so when it becomes viewing audience certain things will have to be included certain things will have to be eliminated so that it contains the concentration attention of the viewing audience for a longer period of time if it happens to be adult audience then your choice is different if it happens to be young adults your choice is different if it happens to be children your choice is something different that's exactly why when a movie is created you have uh, the statement day it is meant for 16 plus or 18 plus or 7 plus specifically because many things come into uh, making of a movie from a verbal medium to visual medium you can even uh, have narnia in your hand any fairy tale and how the fairy tale gets to the visual medium what changes take place in it you will be in a position to understand right so that happens to be the genreic shift then you have your individual shift when you come about talk about the individual shift the writer if the writer happens to be the translator we can take tago though i do not know bangla fine uh, when i visited calcutta i i could gather this information that he felt absolutely at ease in bangla when he wrote his geetanjali then when he had to translate it into english fine as i told you you have to alienate a text in some places when you bring something to your country you have to domesticate it so it's 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 worth doing a project on when you have a writer who is also a translator of his own work we will understand the compromises he is compelled to make because of the cultural untranslatability there is another dangerous shift according to uh, anton popovich he says the negative shift the negative shift is what of course uh, dryden called imitation you move so far away from the original that your rendering has the least resemblance to the original so that is always a negative shift is never recommended at all right now these shifts we make because we have to either adapt a text to our contemporary scenario or we have to when you transport or export if i can use that word your your text to an uh, foreign reading audience you have to alienate a text right coming to a very beautiful form which most of us are very comfortable with where again i tell you when i talk about science 
science alone helps you to keep on improving a particular work when somebody said fine atom is indivisible we did not stop with that we went on to prove that atom is divisible and then we went on to prove that it can also become till we reach the nanoparticle and um, science moves on in the same way if you are a translator who is very analytical in your mind if you are a translator who would like to achieve perfection like ak ramanujan when he translated the vintage classic uh, he had two anthologies one is interior landscape where he draw uh, he could draw from the agam literature then he moved on to poems of love and war from agam literature and puram literature it's worth reading uh, the afterword and the foreword where he keeps on telling you one thing the compromises he has to make because as coleridge put it the organic unity which is inbuilt in the uh, poem itself would defy all definition and will not let you disturb it even if a single word gets removed the to total thing becomes meaningless so ak ramanujan he tells when he went on to tell somebody um, that he is a poet the question was have you read agam classics mm. he said um, yes then the answer was then what else do you have to write on when he said no i have not read why at all do you write so everything is already written when if you go back to shelley the thing is everything is already there the only thing is you still have a chance to look at it in a novel way so what did ak ramanujan do he translated his uh, the uh, uh, vintage classics and called them interior landscape look at the title because in the vintage classic of agam literature specific geographical condition is imperative for a specific mood that prevails between two lovers you have kurunji mullai marudam neidal pale kurunji happens to be of course kerala right so when you it is to be lovers union there has to be this particular uh, you have the backdrop the canvas the canvas on which this particular feeling gets painted on so if anything goes wrong you have the uripurul uripurul talks about the feeling you have the karupurul the visible things and you have the other things also there and the mudarpurul uripurul karupurul you have a deity you have flora you have fauna you have a particular occupation of the people and none of these people have got any name because agam classic says the hero or the heroine even these words are inappropriate they don't use the word hero or heroine they say aval sonnadu avan sonnadu that is what he said what she said because there is a she in every one of us and there is a he in every one of us as a result of which name is after all an accident an unwanted thing if a person does not understand this philosophy this grammar that operates in agam literature you may fail miserably and that's exactly what as a translator ak ramanujan says ak ramanujan is a poet himself and when he translated he said it was such a a huge responsibility and when you compare two poems that have been translated by him you find the same poem in anthology 1 that is interior landscape and in the second one poems of love and war you will find there is a difference in the way the lines have been arranged the words have been arranged he says the silence between the words are shelly put it the silence between the words it swells and shrinks according to my mindset one first time i read it it tells me something else second time i read it it tells me something totally different from what i understood in the first way so what happens i have to translate one of my interpretations and not that cannot be the only interpretation that is the challenge the original gives so with all all the tools you have in your hand administer the same thing the same proverb or the same poem written in malayalam give it to the students ask them to translate it make it as simple as possible ask them to translate it ask the same poem to be translated by the same bunch of students the next day they are rendering will be different because when you read the poem for the first time you introduce a poem and you are just an informed reader of the poem because the teacher would have 
uh, told you about the author, the time in which he lived and uh, the theme, everything. So you get the information from your teacher and you are just an informed reader. As an informed reader, when you try to translate, your rendering is something different. After a month, go to the same poem and you now read the poem, you will understand that you have new, new understanding of the poem. I can again use the same thing. You get to get you get to know something more than what you got in your first reading. Now you become an intelligent reader. You know what to read and what not to read. And as Shelley put it, the text within a text, the subtext, the context, the pretext, all these are taken into consideration. Read the same poem after a year, maybe one year or two years, right? You have your experience with life has improved, your perspective of life has improved, right? And you have been reading a lot of uh, related works. And when you come to the third reading, this time you become an enlightened reader because the way you look at it is something totally different from the first reading and the second reading and your translation will also undergo considerable change. And when you come to the fourth one, you become an empowered reader because you know this is exactly how Agam literature will be. This is how Kurundogai poems will be. This is exactly how Agana Nuru will be, Ainguru Nuru will be. So as you are very familiar with all the available tools, what happens? You look at the poem, you also would have become older by two or three years. And now the way you look at the poem will be something different. And A.K. Ramanujan, as he says, you can only translate one of your understandings of your poem. That becomes a huge challenge because it is a kind of an evolving process and never are you at any point satisfied. So all translations become a kind of adaptation. So adaptation is a blanket term. Um, the original of Vanmiki Ramayana, when it reaches Kerala, it is an adaptation that suits the culture of Kerala. And when it comes to Kamban, it's something different. You do have certain differences in Kamba Ramayana. When you talk about Sita being taken away by Ravana, he uproots her along with the little hut in which she has been asked to stay by Rama and Lakshmana. Because the Tamil culture says a married woman should not be touched by a stranger. So what happens? You find Kamban domesticating the text to suit the sensitivity and sensibility of his reading audience, not the audience whom uh, the original had. So what happens? He goes on to say how Ravana totally uprooted the little hut in which Sita was and took her along. That is, you know, it, it, this is what you call domesticating a text because this always goes with the cultural untranslatability problem and you have to, may I, may I continue? Uh, you may have to mute because your voice, please continue, please continue. Yeah, okay, right. So, when, when you talk about Ramayana, fine, this happens to be uh, an adaptation. When you come to Bharatiyar, you all know, know of his masterpieces, you have Panchali Sabadam, which talks about uh, the vow which Draupadi takes when she was after she being disrobed in the royal court. Now, what happens? He has not taken anything other than this particular part of Mahabharata. No, because the time in which he lived, no, he could correlate the situation. All the sons of, Mah that is, India could not, could not help Mother India to come out from the clutches of slavery. So he wanted to infuse patriotism through his Panchali Sabadam. He was talking about the empowerment of women. So what did he do? He just took that part alone and his Panchali Sabadam, though, it is a part of Mahabharata. It is Bharatiya's Panchali Sabadam. And it is an adaptation because he had a very, very specific objective. I can bring another example. Tennyson's Ulysses. Uh, if you were a student of literature, I think you could not have missed Ulysses of Tennyson. It is again Tennyson's Ulysses because Tennyson, has he had the objective of making the Victorian spirit audible through the speech of his 
Ulysses. It is not the real Ulysses. It is not the original Ulysses. His Ulysses is Tennyson's Ulysses. And we, as you go through, you will understand the social history of England and the history of English literature. All these get into creating the Ulysses who is essentially, uh, that, who he belongs to Tennyson and he belongs to only Victorian era. Another example I can give for adaptation, all these are translations. Thanks a lot to various languages we have and thanks a lot to the passion with which we go on for translating things. Uh, the second, the, the example which I would like to give is the raw material may be the same. Uh, the raw material in the sense that um, Plato's history, the chronicle, the history of kings, when it got translated into English, not, it's not Plato, I'm sorry, Plutarch. Plutarch's work which got translated by north into English that was the raw material to know about the kings and queens uh, of uh, Roman history or Greek history fine why the history of Egypt also now what do we have the person who used this raw material north's translation of Plutarch's lives if I can uh, get you the title of the book lives Shakespeare what did he do he pulled out from that the raw material, he took the raw material and he domesticated the text. He made use of the raw material in such a way that his Cleopatra is Elizabethan Cleopatra and certainly not the original historic Cleopatra. Because he had his viewing audience, he had to enchant them. So be it Inobabas who talks about Cleopatra or the messenger who comes and tells Octavia how Cleopatra looks like right he had to he had to create her make her into an elizabethan cleopatra so when you talk about the elizabethan theater when you talk about the elizabethan attitude when you talk about the elizabethan life you will find shakespeare changing the original historic cleopatra the raw material has been taken and it has been used by the creative genius of the writer to create uh, cleopatra who is essentially english who is essentially elizabethan when we come to Dryden's work, the same raw material has been used. That is, North's translation of Plutarch's lives. The same raw material is used, but Dryden's Cleopatra is Augustan Cleopatra. She is neoclassical in every word, as a result of which all the three unities have to be maintained. Shakespeare never cared for the unities, but Dryden has to take care because it is a neoclassical age. So, if that is the case, his Cleopatra she happens to be an Augustan Cleopatra, Dryden's Cleopatra, who is suitable for the sensitivity and sensibility of his audience. Right. The same raw material is once again used by Bernard Shaw in his Caesar and Cleopatra. Fine. But this Cleopatra is Shavian Cleopatra because Bernard Shaw wanted to make use of the same raw material to suit his viewing audience so translation can be a very interesting provided you get to know about how the same raw material the material is the same but it is being used by every other person in his own way and adaptation as i told you is a huge blanket and of which all these can be incorporated but once again we have to remember as dryden put it a middle path the golden mean aristotle's golden mean is of course advisable for a translator do not become too scientific making use of all the tools of, of having a thesaurus in your hand and uprooting every word and replacing every word in the source language with um, a suitable one according to a thesaurus fine you replace it you will be turning the author word for word which is metaphrase which can be absolutely pathetic when you go for imitation, you distance yourself so much from the original that it doesn't even bear, your rendering doesn't bear any trace of the original. The middle path, which is adaptation, paraphrase, as we give paraphrase, why even Prissy writing is a part of translation. You, you are given a passage and you have to cut it down to one third of its length. So what do you do? You draw the essence. It's not telling the children to sit and count all the words and divide it by three and give something as a, a prissy of a text. No, teaching the children to understand how you chop away the dead wood, just take the essence of it and give the essence of 
whatever has been given in 300 words if you can bring it well within 100 words but yet it communicates nothing other than what the original communicated paraphrase is translation prissy is translation fine adaptations are all translation retold stories are all translations because they still hold they are still closer to the original and this and yet they convincingly cater to the demands of um, the contemporary reading audience also if i can again now as i am addressing an audience in kerala i would like to say I tell you uh, how randamuram by mt vasudevan nayar is again an adaptation maybe this is exactly what shelley was uh, repeatedly insisting upon because when you read a text how you read a text is something totally different sociologically you read a text in a different way psychologically you go in for a different way historically you go in for a aesthetically or as giving much of a thrust on a particular character you go in for a psychoanalysis of bima the second born psychology if you go to freud he that's exactly what he talks about or carl gustav jung when he talks about archetypes when we take once you get a yanapid award immediately it has to be translated into all the languages in india we are so rich we are so very rich that all it gets translated into all the indian languages including english also in english so what happens if a person is not very familiar with mt's narrative style which is a camera view technique where you have interior monologue where you have direct interior monologue and indirect interior monologue you will not know which character speaks which uh, dialogue or even his vilaba yatra for that matter if you are not very sure of the technique used by mt vasudevan nayar and if you try to translate his first person narrative would rather become a third person's perspective you cannot say so said bima because bima happens to be it is direct mono, interior monologue so you have to know stream of consciousness and if you have to translate the Uly ulysses the novel by james joyce you will be really confused because he does not care for punctuation marks and what is a punctuation mark but the body language of a written text see when i when i orally utter a statement my body language the tilt of eyebrow or shrug of a shoulder or the tone of my voice or the modulation will make you understand that i have asked you a question and i have not just made an exclamation but when it comes to the written text what happens you have to have a body language for the written text and your punctuation marks are the body language of a written text but in a stream of consciousness if when you use stream of consciousness technique you do not go in asking uh, with a question mark or a comma or a semicolon because it's stream of consciousness where the stream does not get it it doesn't allow any obstruction made by the punctuation marks if you do not know this how can you translate so the tools are they on the other hand it is something spontaneous as a piece of art it is something spontaneous free natural creative original but originality well within a frame or if i can put it controlled freedom is enjoyed by a translator but he has to make use of all these so that the translation will be at least that particular rendering done during that particular time will be closer to the original now before i conclude i just would like to borrow three more minutes uh, because exactly at six o'clock i got it and by seven i should be giving it back um, you can give assignments in the class because when i prescribed this as a paper translation studies we had theoretical foundations we made it into 100 percent 10 percent internal paper so that uh, the boundaries become very very flexible and uh, i can invite people who are both proficient and efficient in these two languages i had to get the help of the hindi professor also and another thing uh, we had a few students from uh, bhutan who never knew who did not know hindi who did not know tamil but they have to take up their assignment for translation they have their project so we uh, in french they cannot translate because they do not know french either so you know what they did from one genre to another genre we got it translated the opening scene of macbeth the 13 lines of 
Macbeth, the opening scene where the three witches enter with lightning and thunder and rain and conclude with the, uh, the couplet, fair is foul, foul is fair, hover through fog and filthy air. Fine, that, that is a theme because in Macbeth, it is, it is, it is just not, uh, it's, a, it's a black tragedy, more than a dark tragedy because if you go to Milton, he'll say darkness visible. So this is more of a black tragedy. Those children made the opening scene of Shakespeare's Macbeth into the first chapter of a horror story, a horror a piece of a fiction. Fine. So from one genre to another genre, as I told you, the genre shift. Uh, a short story can be made into one act play. So we tried this. We had translation of uh, proverbs, then word hunt. A word will be given and the students will have to find equivalent for it from a thesaurus. We used more of thesaurus than a dictionary. But for everything, then we had, we translated the titles of various poems, including Stopping by Woods on a sna Snowy Evening or Road Not Taken. Most of us mistake the poem when we read or when we teach. It's about the road taken by the poet. No, the poem gives much of a thrust on the road not taken, a road which is taken by everybody else, but it is not taken by the poet. So if that is the case, how will you translate the title? Because it, it, is, it is so convincingly communicative and uh, when you translate that. And very interestingly, the opening paragraph of Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Now take it as an assignment. I would rather request the LTIF people. Uh, it is absolutely challenging. So while doing this, I was in Kerala, I was in Thrissur. I think it was current book house I invaded. Uh, I went and asked for the translation of uh, uh, Tale of Two Cities in Malayalam. How you have translated and I just wanted to see how the opening paragraph is because he, you find Dickens using age, time, era, eon, almost every other word, the period. So do we have equivalent in our language. We say ours is very rich. Again, giving a, another kind of break, telling the children to compare Tom Sawyer, Adventures of Tom Sawyer with Swaminathan, that is in Malgudi days, you have Swami and friends. Compare. The Western counterpart, you have Mark Twain's uh, um, Adventures of uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Here you have the Swami Nadan, that is, you have uh, his Swami and friends. Now, how are we going to translate? So, these, these things are very challenging. So, the, my students used to have their workshop file where we'll have the original piece. Then we'll have the problems identified. After identifying the problem, we will see whether it is a cultural problem or linguistic problem. We will look at it from various angles and identify what the problem could be and what kind of an untranslatability or transnationality, if I can quote again Anton Popovich, transnationality, which is untranslatable. If that is the case, problems identified, then next part will be compromises made. What kind of a compromise? We understood that it is not equivalent hunting. It's looking for equivalence. Fine. In that case, we took the opening part of Manya by M.T. Vasudevan Nair, where the genius of Malayalam is so great that it, it could not be translated into English or Tamil. Varum Varadirikulya. Varum, we do not know, we do not have the subject, we do not know about the gender, we do not know whether it is singular or plural because Malayalam can accommodate this one word and make it appear as one sentence. So it can be avanvarum, avalvarum, aduvarum, avarvarum, everything. But in Tamil it is not possible. In Tamil you have to say avanvaruvan. So that the verb ending will say that it is singular and masculine. You cannot contain uh, the, uh, I, I do not know, again the genius of Malayalam. Until the paragraph comes to a close, you will not know who will come. Varadirikulya. Varamal irkamatan, Varamal irkamatal. In English again, he will come or she will come or it will come. You have to have the subject. So throw it as a challenge. 
Let the children make use of all these. And when, when I conclude, there is so much of job opportunity there in translation, leave alone Sahitya Academy. You have all the movies they get uh, dubbed or you go in for subtitling and subtitling is an area where you make use of translation both as a science and as an art. The creative genius of a person who is very proficient in the mother tongue and equally proficient in the other tongue has got a wonderful job opportunity where in subtitling you are a reader, you have to read what is going on and you have to see the movie and if the movie is in your language you have to compare and see whether the subtitling given in English is appropriate or inappropriate. So, I think I have, I have, as I told you, I have given you only the tip of the tip of an iceberg. But it's such an interesting area with so much of opportunity. And if I can again tell you, India is uh, a rich reservoir of uh, languages and literary produce. And I would like to show this is the book of Kurundogai, uh, which I compiled and uh, edited. It has translations of the vintage classic, right? Along with the prose rendering and verse rendering. And maybe this is exactly what compelled me to go in for my second PhD in Tamil so that uh, I can say something about it. Fine. So thank you ever so much once again to Professor Praveen and Professor Bhaskaran Naya for the wonderful, wonderful chance you could uh, give to me. And again, once again, thanks a lot to the person who introduced me, who's, who so beautifully said Tamil and not like most of the people, Tamil. An Englishman can never say Tamil, so he said Tamil, but we know it is Tamil. Thank you. Thanks a lot.